Hi everyone. This video is going to be about identifying informal logical fallacies. Um, I'm going to leave out all the starred questions. You can find those answers. Number two. Mr. Wilson said that on July 4th, he went out on the veranda and watched the fireworks go up in his pajamas. We conclude that Mr. Wilson must have had an exciting evening. This is amphiboly. Um, so the fireworks going up in his pajamas, you know, makes it sound like they went off in his pajamas, like woo. Um, but obviously what it means is that he went out on the veranda while he was in his pajamas to watch the fireworks go up. So because there's a misinterpretation here of an ambiguous phrase, this is amphiboly. Number three, I'll let you read that. So just pause and read it. And then we'll talk more. About it. Okay, so this is a couple things. Um, I think this is false cause and also uh, a hasty generalization. So first of all, um, the, the Newtown massacre did not occur because the teachers weren't armed. It occurred because a crazy human being did one of the most horrific acts in the history of, or most recent history of our country um, and took his anger and frustration, whatever else, I have no sympathy for that person, um, out on and murdered a bunch of babies, essentially. Uh, that was the cause. It wasn't because teachers weren't armed. So that's the false cause problem. Um, and then the other thing, the general, hasty generalization here is that all teachers should be armed with guns because one thing happened. So um, I think there's a couple things here that relate to informal fallacies. Every member of the Delta Club is over 70 years old. Therefore, the Delta Club itself must be over 70 years old. This is fallacy of composition. So you're taking the individual uh, people here um, and you are collectivizing the attributes of them to the club. Of course, a club doesn't have to be 70 years old um, for people who are 70 years of age to have joined it. Club might have started two years ago and they have a bunch of people who are over the age of 70. So um, that's fallacy of composition. Of course, you should eat Wheaties. Wheaties is the breakfast of champions. Uh, this is false cause. So people aren't champions because they eat Wheaties. Um, and so uh, it's a false cause. That's not the cause of the people being champion, uh, champions. And also, there might be a little bit of begging the question here, too. Um, you should eat your Wheaties because it'll make you a champion, but there's no explanation of why Wheaties makes champions. Uh, the idea that black people, we'll skip the starred questions. The idea that black people in this country live in poverty is ridiculous. Look at LeBron James. He's a millionaire, so are Sean Combs, Samuel L. Jackson, and Michael Jordan. So this example is one of suppressed evidence, I would say, but there's something else interesting going on here. Another interesting fallacy, I think. Um, it's kind of like a reverse composition faculty or even division. Um, sorry, fallacy, I think I might have said faculty. Um, so, okay, first of all, obviously there's suppressed evidence here. Using four people who are all extremely wealthy as your, um, as your test group doesn't prove that that claim is ridiculous. But also it's almost like division as well. It's like, what it's saying is that, okay, so the, the group as a whole lives in poverty, thus, every member of the group should live in poverty. But it does a weird kind of modus tollens thing here where it, it says, but here are some members of the group that don't live in poverty. Thus, 
the original statement is false. Um, number nine, no one has ever proved that the human fetus is not a person with rights, therefore abortion is morally wrong. So no one has ever proved that something is not the case, therefore it is the case. This is um, appeal to ignorance. So just because you can't prove that God does not exist, that doesn't mean that God does exist and vice versa. Just because you can't absolutely prove God does exist, that doesn't mean that God does not exist. Um, it's the same thing here. Appeal to ignorance. When a car breaks down so often, this one makes me sad. Mm. When a car breaks down so often that repairs become pointless, the car is thrown on the junk heap. Similarly, when a person becomes old and diseased, he or she should be mercifully <laughs> put to death. This is horrible. Uh, this is a weak analogy. <laughs> uh, humans are different from cars. Most of us would agree. Humans are not inanimate objects that can just be done away with willy-nilly, as can cars. Uh, and so anyway, weak analogy. All right, let's see here. I don't know if I have this. I'll just read it all here. The 20 story Carson building is constructed of concrete blocks. Each and every concrete block in the structure can withstand an earthquake of 9.5 on the Richter scale. Therefore, the building can withstand an earthquake of 9.5 on the Richter scale. Um, this is fallacy of composition. Um, I don't know enough actually about building construction it might not be fallacy of composition if there's a direct correlation between the um, capability of withstanding con um, earthquakes of each individual part. But my guess is it's not uh, a one-to-one -one ratio. So um, this is fallacy of composition. So just because each individual block can withstand 9.5 doesn't mean that when you stack them all up or when you connect them using steel or whatever that the whole thing will be able to withstand the same level of earthquake but if it could then um, it might not be fallacy of composition but i just don't know this administration is not anti-german as it has been alleged germany is a great country it's contributed immensely to the world's artistic treasury goethe and schiller made magnificent contributions to literature and Bach, Beethoven, Wagner, and Brahms did the same in music. Let's assume that this is uh, some, it, as it says, it has been alleged that our administration is anti-German. You can see here that um, the premises do not support the conclusion. So in this case, the arguer is attempting to draw us away. Remember with drawing the bloodhounds away from the trail? This is, um, red herring fallacy. Uh, they're, they're trying to drag us away from the issue, which is um, that our government is anti-German. Um, this misses the point as well, but remember when you miss the point, if there's another fallacy that fits, you should use that. Lots of fallacies kind of miss the point um, where they draw a conclusion that doesn't relate to the premises. In this case, red herring is better. Paul, it was great to see you at the party the other night. Everyone there was doing crack. Incidentally, how long have you been dealing that stuff? Um, um, this is a loaded question. Uh, it assumes that Paul uh, was um, dealing crack. So, um, the uh so the sorry this is complex question also known as loaded question the um but the vernacular for this textbook complex question uh it assumes that paul has been dealing crack just because you're at the party doesn't mean that you're dealing crack if everybody there's doing crack though then that would mean logically you would have to be doing crack which doesn't mean that you deal crack it just means that you do crack 
Senator Chris Murphy's arguments for the protection of wilderness areas should be ignored. Murphy is just another one of those tree-hugging liberals who supports such legislation only to please the environmental nuts in his home state of Connecticut. Which one is this? Ad hominem. We shouldn't ignore somebody's arguments. If we're gonna ignore their arguments, we need to address their arguments, not who they are as a person. And so this is uh, ad hominem, they're attacking the person. It's, it's, um, it's ad hominem abusive and also um, uh, a little bit of uh, ad hominem circumstantial with the, he's doing it only to please the environmental nuts in his home state. And notice there's some abuse on the constituents too, in addition to Senator Murphy. Professor Andrews, surely I deserve a B in logic. I know that I've gotten Fs on all the tests, but if you give me an F for my final grade, I'll lose my scholarship. That will force me to drop out of school and my poor aged parents who yearn to see me graduate will be grief stricken for the rest of their lives. I'm thinking of Ralphie from the um, A Christmas Story. Um, okay. This is appeal to pity. So um, there's no reason that's been given here. Um, the person got Fs. And so they shouldn't, they don't deserve a B. Now, important to note though, if, if a student came and said, um, can I get a better grade? I lost you know, my brother during the semester and I had uh, a pretty significant illness and dot, 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 that might not be appeal to pity because there are reasons why the student got the B or the F grades. And in that case, the, the faculty member might choose to help the student out and it wouldn't be appeal to pity. But here, there's really nothing related to anything that, um, to anything like that related to why the student got Fs. Either we have prayer in our public schools or the moral fabric of society will disintegrate. The choice should be obvious. Two choices. What do we have? False dichotomy. False dichotomy. So there, yeah, okay. So that's the language we're using. False dichotomy. Um, there's another option here. So escape through the horns. One way to do this is to, is to present another option. Um, you can have no prayer in public schools and moral fabric of society will be good. You could have, you could instantiate prayer in public schools and have the um, moral fabric of society be torn apart. Uh, there are lots of different options. White sheep eat more than black sheep because there are more of them. Therefore, this white sheep eats more than that black sheep. This is fallacy of division. So we're going from attributes of the collection, of the collective whole, and then we're going to the distributive. So um, you can read that section in the book. I'm not gonna get into it here. But what it's saying is in general, as a collective body, white sheep on average eat more than black sheep. Um, and, oh no, not on average. It says because there are more of them. So yeah, of course, if there's a thousand white sheep and 10 black sheep, then the thousand white sheep are gonna eat more. And then what it does is it assigns that attribute to the individual. So in this case, there's one white sheep. It must eat more than the black sheep, but of course, that might not be the case. So this is fallacy of division. Motives and desires exert forces on people, causing them to choose one thing over another. But force is a physical quantity governed by the laws of physics. Therefore, human choices are governed by the laws of physics. All right, what do we have here? Equivocation. Conclusion depends on a shift in the meaning of the word or phrase. So um, the shifted phrase is force. So motives and desires exert forces on people, but force is a physical quantity. The motives and desires that we have in our will exert a force that's not the force that is a physical quantity. It's, it's something very fascinating and interesting. I wish I could talk more about it. Kant's conception of the will, 
the bad conscience in Freud. Um, um, or sorry, the superego in Freud, the bad conscience in Nietzsche, the will in Kant. There's something in us that exerts force on us, but it's not the physical force of physics, and therefore we've equivocated the term force, and thus we're committing the fallacy of equivocation. Each and every brick in the completely brick-faced Wainwright building has a reddish-brown color, therefore the Wainwright building has a reddish-brown color. This is not a fallacy, I don't think. I don't know, it could be. Feel free to disagree with me. Um, but it's not fallacious. It, you might be thinking, oh, it's fallacy of composition. But if, if you take tiles that all have the same color and you put them all together, then that same color you know, uh, would be kind of radiated to the human. So it's not fallacious to say that. Although that color might look differently in different forms of light. Um, but if you're seeing it as reddish brown in this amount, then you should see it as reddish brown in that amount. Color is kind of interesting though, you know, like if anybody's painted, I used to paint houses. You know, sometimes when you paint a little wall, a little swatch or whatever to let people, oh yeah, I like that, that purple looks nice. And then you paint the whole wall purple and then they're like, whoa, it does not look nice. But it's still purple. So, Pauline said that after she had removed her new mink coat from the shipping carton, she threw it into the trash. We conclude that Pauline has no appreciation for fine furs. Uh, this is um, amphiboly. She threw it into the trash. That's an ambiguous phrase that relates back either to the mink coat or the shipping carton, obviously the shipping carton. Um, but the conclusion that's drawn here is that she threw the mink coat away, which is um, not what she did, so this is amphiboly. We know that induction will provide dependable results in the future because it has always worked in the past. Whatever has consistently worked in the past will continue to work in the future, and we know that this is true because it has been established by induction. All right, we have a couple things here. Um, we have the circular reasoning begging the question, so we're using induction to support the claim that induction will work in the future. But also, um, you might say that we have uh, uh, appealed to tradition. Uh, let's see, what do we got here? Ah, we don't really have appealed to tradition. Hmm. Yeah, well, there's another fallacy called appeal to, tr to tradition. Um, or sorry, we do. Appeal, um, no, that's appeal to fear. We have to have appeal to tradition in here, don't we? Anyway, so then if we don't, then this is uh, begging the question. Uh, but anyway, appeal to tradition is kind of cool, something you should know about. We've always done it this way, therefore we should do it this way in the future, not always true. Now, some of the reasons why we do things the way that we do have been tested over time, sometimes thousands of years. And humans 2,000 years ago were doing it the best way possible given their technology, and so we might still do it the same way today. Um, uh, but just because you've done something the same way all the time doesn't mean that you have to in the future. Mr. Prime Minister, I'm certain you will want to release the members of your, our National Liber, Liberation Group whom you currently hold in prison. After all, I'm sure you'll want to avoid having car bombs go off in the centers of your most heavily populated cities. Appeal to force. If you don't do this, then we're gonna start bombing people. Not a good logical argument, although you might have rational reasons for submitting to such an argument if you were placed in that scenario. Recent studies have shown that conventional food has the same vitamins, minerals, proteins, and other nutrients as organic food. Therefore, it's just as good to eat conventional food as organic food. Um, this would be, my guess is, appeal to unqualified authority. 
or uh, suppressed evidence. Now, um, and we see this a lot. We, people say studies show that, you know, all the time. Um, it's, uh, it's kind of a rhetorical device as well. In some texts, it's listed as a rhetorical device. Um, and so in this case, let's assume that it's appeal to unqualified authority because we would need to see which studies. If we found that the studies were academic, that they were representative of what a majority of the people in the field are saying, then we would know um, that, then we would find, well, okay, yeah, conventional food is just as good and we should eat it. Um, but uh, we need to see those studies. And just saying recent studies is unqualified authority because you're not telling us which authorities actually said that and whether or not they're authorities. Oh, this is interesting. They must have written this one a while ago. Let's see what they have to say about Trump. Real estate mogul Donald Trump argues that good management is essential to any business, but who is he to talk? Trump's own mismanagement drove Trump entertainment resorts into bankruptcy three times in 18 years. We actually see this argument made, right? Like Trump's a bad businessman, therefore he's just gonna be a bad president. Um, um, but here, this is actually ad hominem. And the reason why is because actually what Donald Trump says, if he does say this, is true. Good management is essential to any business. Um, well, it depends on what you mean by essential. But good management is usually essential to employee happiness. Good management is usually essential to uh, revenue, increasing revenues and decreasing costs and all that stuff. Um, so that's a true statement. So, um, but pointing out that Trump it might not be a good manager has nothing to do with the truth of his statement. So this is an ad hominem. The farmers of our state have asked that we introduce legislation to provide subsidies for soybeans. Unfortunately, we'll have to turn down their request. If we gave subsidies to the soybean farmers, then the corn and wheat growers will ask for the same thing. Then we'll be the cotton growers, citrus growers, truck farmers, and cattle raisers. In the end, the cost will be astronomical. This is a slippery slope. Sometimes um, slippery slopes are not fallacious, but in this case, there's a lot of going on here, a lot of assumptions. And um, at, actually, interestingly enough, we are providing subsidies to the tune of billions of dollars to soybean farmers in the United States right now due to uh, the trade restrictions with China. Um, obviously, people in Asian countries consume a lot of soy products. Um, and they like to rely on American soybeans um, for things like that they produce, like soy sauce and, and all of that. Um, and unfortunately, our farmers, I'm from Indiana, so it was always soybeans and corn pretty much on a rotating scale. Unfortunately, there are farmers that are getting caught up in this. Criminals are basically stupid because anyone who isn't basically stupid wouldn't be a criminal. All right, what do we got here? We've got begging the question. It assumes, they, in this case, they would need to show why criminals are stupid. We know that many criminals are not stupid at all. Um, okay, Professor Glazebrook's theory about the origin of the Martian craters is undoubtedly true. Rudolf Orkin, the great concert pianist, announced his support of the theory in this morning's newspaper. <laughs> Uh, appeal to unqualified authority. Uh, a great concert pianist probably doesn't know much about Martian craters. We see that one a lot. Um, people can become um, experts. So for example, Bill Gates uh, has become an expert on things like sanitation and disease control around the world, um, even though he's, you know, 
the founder of Microsoft and all that. So there are some cases where people can become experts on other things. Um, uh, Al Gore, for example, knows a lot, I'm guessing. I haven't seen much of his stuff on climate change, but it seems like that's what he's dedicated to now. But always be weary uh, or leery of um, wary of celebrities who are like, oh, I care about this and I know about this and whatever else. No, probably not a good idea. Instead, let's go to the scientists who study those things. Let's go to the thinkers within those other countries. You know, somebody might say like, oh, I really care about um, human trafficking or something. Well, there are plenty of um, uh, people in India and Nepal and other, I'm thinking of that because I have a friend who actually like works against trafficking of Nepalese girls into India. Um, but there are people who live there who know way more than we do and we should be listening to them. And a lot of times we listen to celebrities and it's like, oh, the celebrity cares. No, no, why don't we care that like the people who actually live there who know more about it? Anyway, it's kind of sad. Raising a child, all right, this is the last one, I'm getting tired. Raising a child is like growing a tree. Hmm. Sometimes violent things such as cutting off branches have to be done to force the tree to grow straight. Similarly, corporal punishment must sometimes be inflicted on children to enforce them to develop properly. This is a weak analogy. Trees don't have wills. <laughs> they might. Uh, it depends on what you mean by will though. Plants actually, I would say they do have a will uh, in the sense, in the Bergsonian sense. There's some impetus driving um, their continued production and creation of themselves, their growth, one might say. So in, in the Bergsonian and Schopenhauerian sense, um, well, no, not really Schopenhauer, but, but anyway, let's just say trees don't have wills, trees don't have souls or brains or minds, whatever you want to call it. Um, and so obviously cutting a branch is different from spanking your child. All right, well, I, I hope that you found this uh, useful and um, good luck with your continual learning and understanding of informal logical fallacies.